Hi, and welcome. My name's Rick Williams. Um, I'm with Rick Williams Consulting, uh, a parking and transportation demand management firm out of Portland, Oregon. Uh, our firm has um, been selected to lead um, this project, um, which is the downtown parking study. This is only one phase of a three-phase project, and Carolyn Egan was going to be here. She's tied up in a meeting, and uh, I'll give you the best I can about just an overview of the whole project, but today we're just going to focus on the downtown. Um, this project is um, scheduled to last about two years. Uh, there's phase one, phase two, and phase three. Phase one is the downtown piece. Phase two is a citywide look at parking, which is really a look at, at your uh, existing uh, zoning regulations um, and requirements for parking for new development and how they impact your overall uh, development code. Phase three is a, sum, uh, is a study very similar to this but for the 14th and Galveston corridor. Um, but the focus right now is on the downtown and that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, I should also let you know out of the gate that uh, one of the main purposes for the meeting today is not only to have a Q&A with you at the end of this uh, presentation, but also to recruit folks to become a part of a downtown parking advisory committee. Uh, if you'd like to participate in the project more um, directly and uh, more actively. What we really want to do today is actually give you a sense of our approach to parking um, and to sort of get a, a sense of what the general best practice elements of parking management are in cities like Bend um, uh, to become a successful, uh, to manage their parking successfully to support the businesses and the vitality in their downtowns. Now we'll start out by saying Bend is very unique. So oftentimes people say, well, give me an example of a city like Bend. Well, I'm not going to do that because what we're going to commit to you is we're going to develop a plan that is unique to Bend. And I'll tell you how we're going to do that. I'll give you a lot of examples today of what other cities may do. That doesn't mean at the end of the day that's what you'll do. What we really want you to do is understand the framework of how parking should be managed in a successful city uh, based on a number of different metrics. If you ask anybody, resident, employee, visitor, anybody, where do you want to park? They say on street. I want to park as close to or in front of wherever I want to go. Seems logical. But in the parking industry, we have to realize, and I think this is important for Ben particularly, because all you have to do is look out the window, and it's busy out there. What is the only supply of parking you can't grow? Street. Right. Because you can, once you get it fully striped, and you can engineer the heck out of it, but at some point in time, you cannot add any more parking on street. Therefore, everybody wants to park on street. At some point, everybody can't. So we have to manage parking to determine who should park on street and where should those who shouldn't park on street be. It's getting the right people to the right place. We're not saying that employees shouldn't park downtown. We're not saying customers shouldn't park downtown. We're not saying residents shouldn't park downtown. We're not saying vendors aren't important. What we're saying is that we cannot continually rely on the on-street system to solve all of our issues. It means, at the end of the day, someone is not a priority. We have to identify who the priorities are for parking and allocate them to those stalls. Some stalls may be prioritized for employees. Some stalls may be prioritized for customers. Some stalls may be prioritized for residents. We have to agree on that. And then, as, if we can agree on that, strategies get easy. Agreement is the toughest part. So all parking uh, experts in the room, that's why we need the data. We need to have that conversation about priorities. That's why we manage parking. Believe it or not, if we do that, our customers will appreciate it. I've said this, this will be my third time, because I've done two of these, is I'm from Portland. I come to Bend a lot. But one of the things I notice when I drive in is it's not intuitive. Where is the public garage? Before I get here, when I get here, where are the mirror pond lots? Can I use that lot over there that's associated with a business that doesn't have any parking on it? It's not intuitive. You got to remember that the first experience that anybody has with your downtown is in a car. 
in a parking space. It's my first experience. I drive in, I'm looking for a place to park. If I don't find it within two minutes, angst occurs. I get anxious, I get mad, I get frustrated. And my experience as, as a result is impacted. My last experience in the downtown is pulling my car out of my stall. Do I feel safe? Is it well lit? Is it clean? That's why we manage parking. I guarantee you, customer wants you to tell them what to do. Quickly, easily, and intuitively. So that's why we manage parking. As I said, eventually we have to grow off of the off-street system. We can't contain all of our demand in the on-street system. Off-street parking is very expensive, so we need to use what we have off-street to the highest degree and to the best maximum use that we can. Then at that time, we can have a discussion about, let's create more. But we have to make sure it's so expensive, and I'll tell you, that it, we'll have a slide on, on that, about $35,000 a stall minimum to build a parking stall. So we have to be cognizant of that and think about that. The very last one, businesses want turnover. One employee, and employees are very important, one employee takes up one stall all day. A business, if we take that employee and put them in the right stall, or we take that employee and put them in the transit a bus, five to, six, to eight cars can park in that same stall. Businesses need turnover. And so we need to segregate and understand where is the high turnover to occur, and where is the low turnover best place. And then we find that balance, and, and that's why we manage parking. As I said earlier, I don't like to jump into strategies. And what we need to do first is find consensus. And we're going to begin the stakeholder process with those type of questions. Understanding what Ben's adopted vision plan is for the downtown, expected growth, desired retail, desired office, desired business, desired residential. And we're going to set priorities based on value statements. So I'll ask you one right now. You don't have to answer the question. Who has priority to park in the public supply? Don't ask. We're going to ask the Downtown Stakeholder Advisory Committee to answer that question. Who has priority parking in, on street? Should employees park in neighborhoods? Should residents park on street downtown? There are no right answers. But we have to find consensus on those answers before we can even have a discussion on strategies. And we'll have other priorities. Is How long should we enforce? Uh, what do we do if we exceed certain occupancy thresholds? What's the role of the city in parking? Is the city responsible to provide parking to private employees? Some cities do, some cities don't. But those are the type of things that create guiding principles. If we have a, a, a set of consensus value statements against which we can then bring any strategy and say, why are you recommending doing this, Rick? Because we can say, and the stakeholder advisory committee can say, because it supports guiding principle one, five, and seven. If we don't like the strategy, then we have to go back and change the priority. And what it allows us to do is have a reasonable discussion among experts on how we want to manage our system downtown. So we'll begin with guiding principles. As I said before, many cities leap into management strategies <coughs> before they have a discussion about why you need a strategy in the first place. And so guiding principles will be a key part of this. So priority for every parking stall in our management area will be identified. This is my brain. This is how I look at the world of parking, in four easy boxes. And the industry um, has done this for 100 years. It's called the 85% rule. Very simple. When a parking system, and, and there's hundreds <coughs> of studies that have done it, when a parking system is at 85% occupancy or above for a sustained period, and sustained period we need to define with the stakeholders. Angst goes up. 
Congestion goes up. Business is adversely affected. And people will circle the block endlessly. Donald Shoup, who wrote the book, The High Cost of Free Parking, was able to document that whenever ever systems were over 85% occupied, over 30% of the traffic on street was people looking for parking. Not going to someplace, not going through downtown or out of downtown, simply looking for parking. So what we want to do is we want to look for the sweet spot. And what we found is that when parking systems are operate between 70% and 85% occupancy, turnover is high, customers are happy, business is robust because we have enough volume in the, sit in the downtown to support good business. And the system works really well. What's interesting is a lot of people would say, well, why wouldn't it just always be down here? I mean, what if we had less than 55% occupancy or 69%? What if we just had lots of empty parking stalls? Well, what's interesting is that we have found, and the, and the industry has found, that when parking supplies are routinely parked at less than 69% occupancy, the quality of business goes down. The volume of cars is too low to support real good business. In fact, what we've learned is that retail sales are higher and the quality of the ground level business is better if you hit the sweet spot. It's also very attractive to new businesses wanting to come to your downtown. I was working with a, a city that was way over 85% and they were having trouble attracting new business downtown. So they had vacant stores the businesses wouldn't come because they said too congested no parking and so that's the that's the sweet spot we're looking for because it's supportive to existing business it's attractive to new business and it keeps our customers happy <clears throat> and if we get too long and too and too high it can have long-term adverse impacts on your downtown so Good data. What we're going to do is we're going to separate perception from reality. Parking is a very emotional issue. Always has been. Everybody's got a solution. And, um, but sometimes we're all afraid to pull the trigger. Sometimes the debate is more fun than the solution. Well, we have to stop that. We're going to separate um, perception from reality. Because the city of Bend has invested, I think, wisely in these three parking data analyses, we're going to let the data tell a story. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples here visually. Data is very good, and it can help you make good decisions. We also, in this case, the data is local. Because a lot of people have always criticize parking studies. I've been in other cities that won't invest in the data collection. Uh, they'll say, um, I can remember Ventura, California saying, well, Laguna Beach just finished a parking study. Let's just take their plan and put it in place in our city. This is their data. It was theoretically their guiding principles. had nothing to do with Ventura, California. So we want to make this very local and very unique to, to Bend. We also need to make sure that the data is consistent and replicable. Because we don't want to just do this this year and then go away. And I was here 16, 14 years ago. We don't want to, I'd love to come back in 14 years. But we don't want to do that. We want to be consistent and we want it to be replicable and the methodology needs to be very sound. Uh, and, and I'm going to give you some examples here. This is what I love about data. You can display it. And you can react to people's input. This is tiny little Tigard, Oregon. This map looks bigger than it is. From here to here is less than the distance from one end of the Lloyd Center Mall in Portland to the other. Not that far. They thought they had a parking problem. Why? Look at all, go back to my brain, top box, had all this red right here. They had a problem. So they said, City of Tiger should build us a garage. That'll fix the problem. Look at all this green. Very simple. Localized to Tigard, you don't need a parking garage. You need to link people to the parking you have. 
But what was driving the perception, and theoretically, without the data, driving the strategies, was this. Another example is from Salem, Oregon. And this is what's nice. They did three years in a row of data collection. So think about your three seasons that we'll do. And they were able to compare over three years, occupancies every year. I'm sorry for the size of this, but the right-hand column was 2012. And the left-hand column is 2015. From here to here, parking was over 85%. So for five to six hours a day, you couldn't park on street in the core of downtown Salem. We used this data and began, but we also noticed that Salem also had some a lot of green boxes on the, on the uh, uh, off-street parking system. We began to deploy some strategies in downtown Salem to get employees and customers into their free parking garages. So what's great about data is we, we have the baseline, we have a problem, we implemented strategies, and look, the occupancies on street went down, and we correlated that directly to the occupancies off street that went up. So our strategies were not chasing people out of the downtown, they were chasing people where we wanted them to park. That's what data does for you. And the last example I'll give you is one of my favorites. This is from Everett, Washington. Everett had really high occupancies as well in their core, over 85%. <coughs> their first response was, let's meter, right? Industry says when you're over 85%, think about pricing. Well, that's a big decision for a town to make. So we went back into the data, and the first thing that caught our eye was this number right here. They have time stays all throughout their downtown, but 14% of the time, people are violating the time stay. So we weren't enforcing that anymore. Then we took the data one step further, and we found out that, I'm going to drop this box down here, 360 people a day were parking for longer than four hours on street. The total on-street parking supply was 1,892 stalls. Usually people who are parking four hours or longer are employees. But then we took it even a step further. And we said, we got this number. We I said, you know, when we do data, we take license plates. These are the number of license plates, 360, that were moving around the downtown all day long. Every two hours, we'd find this license plate somewhere else. So we added that number, 360, to that number, 380. 740 cars a day were gaming the system. 42% of their supply is being used by employees. If we take the employees out of the mix, their occupancies come down. So what was driving, we could have made a decision by saying, well, it's over 85%, let's start making some tougher decisions. But by looking at the data, we learned that what our first thing to do was enforce, change the rate structures in the off-street facilities so the employees had a reason to park in the garages, and all of a sudden we didn't have to meter. That could go to a longer-term strategy. Because now we knew that, that only people that were using the on-street system were our customers and visitors. So I can't emphasize enough, let the data tell a story and then be open to the solutions that the data suggests. I also want to talk about the value of parking stalls. Because in the future, every city has to start thinking about new supply. Now the new supply could be downtown, the new supply could be a remote lot connected by transits. You know, we don't know where we're going yet. We need to have that conversation with the community. But I think it's important to understand the value of a parking stall. On the West Coast, and your number may be higher, but on the West Coast, it costs between thirty dollars and $35,000 to build a parking stall. Now, what I want you to do is pretend that you live in it. So you've got to pay the mortgage. What's the mortgage on a parking stall? Well, if you run a 20-year cost to finance at 4% to 5.5% financing, your mortgage payment is going to be $197 to $240 per month. So that's what it costs to build a parking stall. Yes, ma'am? What are the SDCs the City of Bend collects for a parking stall now? 
That I don't know. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know. So, go ahead. we do have an in lieu parking fee downtown, which mm -hmm. I think is 22000 22000 But yeah, we don't, we don't park, charge a parking SDC. And then are your figures based on an above ground structure yes. versus a below ground structure? A below ground structure in Bend, it might be more, but again, just using the West Coast averages, a below ground structure would be 35% more than this. I think it would be helpful to get a cost for the structure mm -hmm. that was recently built so we can. Yeah, and, talk and we're going to do that then. with the advisory team. We have all those numbers of what it cost to build it in 2000 when it was built. I can't remember when it was built. But yes, we have that. But these are averages. Again, this is a West Coast number. And it's more, it's, again, I want you to know how we think and what, what the value of a stall is to a downtown. And, and understanding that there is a mortgage that has to be paid. Now let's say it's a community garage. We have to discern, you know, the garage is serving the community. Private sector, public sector, visitors. Who pays for it or who should pay for it? Well, there's a limited number of beneficiaries of a parking garage. There's developers in the downtown. There's building owners who are within proximity of it. Um, there's the city in terms of because visitors are coming downtown uh, and customers and are, are, are bringing money to the downtown. There's the building tenant, those people who are in the buildings that are built, not the building owner, but the tenant. And there's users, customers, employees, and residents. Or all, all you know, you can all or um, some combination of. Like I told you before, I built a lot of parking garages because I um, used to be uh, with a development company in Portland, Melbourne Mark Development Company. And we built about seven garages. What we learned, and even though we were a private developer, we never built a garage with one source of revenue. Of course. And thank you for whoever said that. Yeah, it, it's common sense, right? It's just common sense. But even the private sector can't build them with one source of revenue. Every now and then you get lucky, like you guys did when you built your garage, where you just took all of it was urban renewal. So the mortgage payment was completely covered by the city. The only, there's no debt service on that garage, it was just operating costs. That was a lucky, that's a gimme. That doesn't happen very often. But here's an, a way that we look at funding the value of a parking store. So as we move into the future and the conversation we need to have with the community, if new parking is in our future, Who's going to pay for it? Who's responsible? And it's going to be up to the community to decide that. But as you can see, um, uh, if you put your if you put your hand at the bottom left-hand corner, the original garage built in Ben was all in that box. Most garages that are built, and I'm working on parking garages now in Ventura, California, in Seattle, Washington, um, in uh, Tacoma, Washington, in Portland, and we're, struck, we're, we're, we're looking at all the boxes. And so I think, I just want you to think of it in that terms, that you know someone's got to pay the mortgage. But there's another way to look at the value of a parking stall. That was sort of, ooh, you know, dreary, doom and gloom look at the value of a parking stall. This is a more optimistic view. This is a study we did in Vancouver, Washington. And the reason I picked Vancouver, Washington is because it's not big. <coughs> You'll understand this in a second. Vancouver's a nice little town, but it's not Bend, Oregon. But in Vancouver, Washington, we sat down with the businesses in Vancouver, with the Vancouver Downtown Association, and we did some data collection, and we found out that a parked vehicle on street in downtown Vancouver, so an occupied parking stall, turns over 5.6 times a day. So one stall, 5.6 times a day. All of the retailers, and, and we asked all the retailers at the ground level and all the businesses at the second level to give us the average cost per transaction. And it's easier to do in Washington because they have sales tax revenue. But they had to average it because it had to be people who come into your business and don't spend a penny to the person who comes into your business and been $300, like a jeweler. But at the end of the day, the Vancouver Downtown Association told us that they make about, the businesses in downtown make about $31.55 for every car parked downtown. So, in a given day, that stall on that block face generates $176 in sales. 
or $53,000 in sales every year. So you can see the value of a parking stall is huge. It's very huge. In 2002, in Bend, when we did the original parking study, believe it or not, the average vehicle parked on street in downtown Bend in 2002 was there for an hour and 18 minutes. So when we have our perception and reality thing about how long people are actually parking down there, <coughs> we'll have this new number. That means you were turning over, in 2002, 7.6 times a day. And I have a feeling, as I said, I use Vancouver because it's not Bend. What do you think the value of that on-street parking stall is to the business <coughs> community in downtown Bend? I bet you it's more than $53,500. So that's why we have to get back to getting the right vehicle in the right stall. This is a very valuable space. The more we can turn it over, the better we are. And I apologize for the quality of this slide. I won't dwell on it too long. But we took a bunch of cities that we have worked with in the last five years, and we separated them out simply by their turnover number. We took a middle ground and said five is the middle. So all those cities that turn over more than five times a day, we called higher tier cities. All those cities that turned over less than five times a day, we called lower tiered cities. And then we went down and actually evaluated the quality of their street level with their business associations. And what we found was really interesting. In the lower volume cities, the average customer stay was two hours and 12 minutes. And what we found out is that two hours and 12 minutes was being influenced by the number of employees who were parking on the street. Think Everett. So the two hour and 12 minutes was a false number. But they were slowed down by the number of employees who were parking on the street. In the higher tiered cities, they didn't have as, as significant of employee problems parking on their street. Their enforcement numbers were good. They didn't have a 14.2 uh, like ever or 19% violation rates. Their violation rates were between 5 and 7%. We also found that the average customer stay in the higher volume cities was an hour and 26 minutes. Across the board, all cities are different. But what distinguished all those cities, what they all basically had the same time step. You guys were an hour and 18 minutes. We'll give you a new number. But what was interesting, there wasn't a lot of variation between cities. What was, what was driving the uh, reality of having a better downtown, better retail, better quality, uh, higher retail transactions was their turnover number. And the fact that they didn't have enforcement problems and the fact that they were controlling their employees from parking on the street. So the, the, the lower volume cities had a higher percentage of employees parking on the street, higher violations rate, and lower sales per transaction. So again, it's the value of a parking stall. We're just trying to reinforce that we need to keep this in mind is that we have to make hard decisions about how we manage our, our prime, prime supply, which is our on-street supply, and our off-street supply. We need to keep this in mind. I told you about driving into to Bend. You know, uh, I always hate when I see a green, big green P with an arrow. And then I follow the big green P with an arrow, and I don't see any facilities off street that have a big green P with an arrow. So it doesn't tell me. It just says, go down this street. You're on your own. We need to look at your downtown back to how do we reduce the angst. And part of that is communications. And these are just examples of cities who have begun to identify their parking system. Albany, New York, has a, uh, a yellow P and a dark blue background. That's their city colors. So people in Albany identify with it because that's their city colors. When we did Smart Park in Portland back in 1992, we chose red and black. And you know why we chose red and black? Blazers. Trailblazers, red hot and rolling. Because we did some market research and we asked people a simple question on the street. When you think of Portland, what color do you think of? And it was red and black. I love what little Springfield, Oregon is doing. Um, think about your two-hour on-street parking signs. Two hours free parking and then blah, 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 blah. Right? <laughs> and I'm 60 years old. I can't see it from my car. 
So what I loved about what Springfield did is very intuitive. Same thing. Uh, you can't really see it here, but their, their city colors are like navy blue and this really pretty green. So those are their city colors. It's in their city logo. So they created, this is the on-street parking, and they really emphasize this, I call it a stylized P. So how many people park on street? Thousands. So they're getting this hit. Ooh, this P. Oh, they, and then, you know, and I can see it. Oh, two hours. Three hours. Oh, and I can park from eight to six, so I know when enforcement's in place. But then they took that P and put it in every off-street facility where visitors are allowed to park. So now you come in and you see the, you don't see the green P with the arrow. You see the stylized P and it'll give you a location, third and Alder, second and Yamhill. And you reinforce it on the street. So I as a customer know, of course I can park off street here. That is public parking it's because I, I see it all the time. So see how simple that was? But we don't have that here yet. And so that's what we, we need to commit to marketing the system. And we start doing that by branding it. And you can have simple, like Albany and, and Springfield. Uh, there's a, you know, here's McMinnville, Oregon. And again, brown, they need to change their city colors, brown and yellow. But the same thing, you know, that's what people identify in McMinnville with. And so they have a big P all day. That means you can park there all day. And then they have other lots that say visitors, and they might have a time stay on. But everything's coordinated, and you can pull that off the facility and pull it into the public right-of-way. And then you pull it from the public right-of-way into maps, brochures, apps, communications, whatever. Drop-ins. Uh, a local store is doing an advertisement. They drop that logo in the, the bottom right-hand corner of their advertisement in the newspaper. So very simple. Uh, and cities like Bend don't have to do elaborate campaigns like we did in Portland. You can do something very simple like what they've done in Springfield. But like I said, the customer appreciates it. They want it. They want to be told what to do. But great communications is not just visual things like signage and posters and, and radio ads and, and stuff like that. It's also presentation. And we had a lady last night who was great. She's a downtown business person. And she said, I don't like going to the garage because the pay station is always broken. That is, is marketing, right? That's presentation. And so what we need to do is we need to have a plan, and we will, to identify high quality signage and place it in the appropriate places. We need clean and optimally working equipment. And every lot that we want the public to park on needs to look exactly the same. If it's a surface lot, it needs to have a, a landscaping standard, a signage standard, and a lighting standard. In the garage, we need to have cleanliness standards. We need to have high quality equipment, no trash or debris, and a consistent design. So all I want to do is push is that communication is more ver it's not just verbal and branding and cool marketing. It's also the visual presentation of your system. Even on-street striping is extremely important. My mom always told me uh, she hates what Portland's doing because Portland's pulling all the striping off the street because they want to jam more cars. Um, on every block face, right? Well, my mom says, give me a target. Right? She's older. This is a target. This separation gives me a feeling of safety. And it may be better to and you guys do a pretty good job of striking, <coughs> but it may be better to give away a few on-street stalls to make the customer feel better about your downtown. Because they're walking with, when I'm in downtown Portland and I live there, I just feel hmm, constrained all the time because of the parking. Or I get really mad because the little smart car is nine feet away from the F-150. And so it just looks inefficient and it looks un, uh, un, not orderly and it doesn't contribute to my perception of the downtown, a positive perception. Something that we're going to do, because we don't know, like I said, one of the first things, it's never been done in Bend, we're actually going to go out and survey representative samples of private facilities. We don't know if they're full, we don't know if they're ava available, excuse me. But we know more and more cities are moving to shared parking. And it's usually through a peer-to-peer -peer relationship with downtown business associations. The city can collect the data and provide the business <coughs> association 
with a list of lots that have available parking. The business association can then go marry people who need parking for their employees to lots that have available supply. And many cities, uh, McMinnville, Gresham, Oregon City, Kirkland, Laguna Beach, Seattle, have variations of what I call a customer first program, where they do just that. The uh, staff member of the business association or the executive director of the business association. In downtown Oregon City, it's the executive director of the, of the Main Street program in Oregon City. They go door to door and they say, We've been collecting all this data for years on your lot, and you have a 50 stall lot, and there's always 15 empty stalls. Bob needs five stalls. Can you put five stalls on your lot? Can you put five employees on your lot? If he does, you still have 10 empty stalls. And that's it. So one of the things we're going to do is we really want to see what the shared use opportunity is here in Bend. We don't know. We have no idea what it is. But more and more cities are moving towards it. Because a lot of cities, most of the parking in, in the downtown is actually owned by the private sector. You have the on-street system, and then the rest of it's privately owned. Bend may be different, but we'll have those numbers soon. So that's something to look at, too. Um, big elephant in the room is always, when do you begin to have a discussion about pricing? And we want to say right out of the gate, we have no opinion one way or the other. I gave you the uh, example of Everett where we talked them out of going to pricing um, because it wasn't time. But what we can tell you, again, from the industry standard, the in industry point of view, you have guiding principles, you have data collection, and you have the 85% rule. That's the discussion you need to have about when or if uh, you would go to, free, um, to price parking on street. I think you always begin with the basics. Enforcement, good signage, good communication. Believe it or not, businesses taking responsibilities for their employees telling them where to park. Uh, Gresham, back to that customer first example, they have made a pact. They've all, and businesses in downtown through their business association sign it. That makes parking a condition of employment. And it's a pact between and among businesses. It's not, a, it's not a, a regulation, it's not a requirement. But they sign the pact and they would then, I'm coming in and I, I get, here's my salary, here's my vacation schedule. Um, Here's my health benefits, and here's where I'm parking. And if one business calls another business and says, Wendy is, not park Wendy is out parking in front of my business, it's that business's responsibility to deal with Wendy. It's not the city's responsibility to deal with Wendy. So that's something to look at. Um, but I wanted to emphasize, though, it's important to know that free parking doesn't necessarily result in more parking demand. If that was the case, Springfield, Canby, Tillamook, towns where that have um, occupancies that barely approach 45% of the peak hour should be booming. What creates parking demand is your product. The reason Bend has a problem is because you're so good at what you do. And so, uh, it's another thing to think about when you have a discussion of pricing. Again, we're not pushing it one way or the other. We have to put it on the table as a long-term solution. But I think it's important to know, it's because we're all parking experts, if we believe that putting a parking stall somewhere is going to generate a trip, we're wrong. Because what I would do is go out and find a vacant piece of land somewhere between here and Sisters and build a garage, open it up, put a sign out, say free parking, and here comes all the business. It's not true. What we need to do is make sure the parking is always supporting your product. And what we don't want to do is make any decisions that would negatively affect the bin product. The, some of the questions, though, that we'll be asking the Stakeholder Advisory Committee, using guiding principles, the data, and the 85% rule, is there a conflict in the supply between users? Because we're going to prioritize the supply now, then we have to ask, are there people in the supply that's prioritized who shouldn't be there? Are non-priority parkers? And then, is pricing a way to deal with that? That's one approach. Is there a need or a desire to expand the capacity of your system? Do you need to grow your system? Go back to the multi-funding option with the four boxes of who is responsible and who could pay. 
That's the context that we'll have the discussion. We don't have any preconceived notions. And like I said, we've worked with many cities where we've told them it's not time to do that. It's a decision that the community needs to make, but I think it needs to be made in the context of, of what I've described above. Everybody gets enamored with technology. And I can tell you right now, this is my bet, that 15 years from now, uh, in cities that have parking meters, they won't exist. Um, all those cool pay stations that you see now, that is the, the cutting, cutting edge technology, is gonna go away. Because I have this. And every city in America is gonna load into a database, this GIS system, and I'm gonna pull up to a curb, and I'm gonna hit my app, and it's gonna say, you're in Bend, you're on block 7A, you have two hours, and it's free. And it will know you're there. If they have pricing, it will say, you're in downtown Seattle, it's $4 an hour. Crazy. Um, and uh, you can park up to two hours, what do you want? And I'll say, one hour. And it'll load all that information into a handheld that the enforcement officer has. That's where technology is going. But the problem with technology is there are no um, Ford Motor Companies out there, uh, GMs out there. If you Google parking app, there's thousands of them. They're fighting each other still to see who is going to be the GM or the Ford. Uh, In-ground sensor systems, um, overhead uh, counter systems, they're all new technologies. And um, you don't want to be a beta city. And my favorite example is this city right here. I cannot remember the city because I've been doing this too long. But what's interesting about this, this is a sign that says they have paid parking on the street. You can pay by self. But literally, in my car, that's what I see. I can't even see that from here. They have a new technology. They've invested thousands of dollars in it. And this is the only message they give to their customer. No one uses it. So they have this cool technology, but no one uses it, and they're losing money on it. Um, new technologies come with sophistication and complexity. And any city co that commits to new technology is going to have to commit to a new organization and new, to, and new um, management techniques to keep up with it. And also, one of the key elements of that is they're going to have to support that continuously. Um, uh, Ventura, California has a system that you can um, add hours to your meter. So you go and put two hours in. But if I go to the theater, if I want to put another hour in, all I have to do is get on my phone and do it. Doesn't work, no one uses it, guess what? They don't have a marketing program that says they have it. You gotta go to the city's website. You know, <laughs> well, if I'm going to the theater, am I gonna go to the city's website? So it's really important, there's a lot of new technology out there. I would say as we go through this process and we work with the committee on new technologies and, and what's out there, if, this, if the committee says this is a direction they wanna go, we're gonna recommend they either come in and do a demonstration project with it or let's go do case studies of other cities who are doing it and report back what they're experiencing and what they've learned and the costs that they've paid. So don't be enamored with new technology. But as I say that, I'm telling you, it's where the industry is going. So I just want to sum up by saying, what are successful cities doing? I've given you a lot of examples, giving you a lot of information, and then we're going to have about 20 minutes to talk. Clear priorities. The cities that are the most successful know where they're going. They know who their priorities are. They know who's responsible. They've established roles and responsibilities. And then they manage to that. And they stick to the plan. They also have met all their goals are measurable. They use data to make decisions. And those are the, any city that, name a city that you really, really like, and I bet you if they have a parking program, it's because they have guiding principles and they're out measuring it constantly. Customer first programs. This is where there's a recognition in the successful cities, that this is not just the city's problem, the public sector's problem. It's a combined responsibility. It's a joint responsibility. Businesses have to say, I will take responsibility for my employees. Businesses have to say, if we can, I will share my parking if I'm not using it. Because I'll partner with my downtown. Downtown's a community. Downtown's a family. Um, and so the successful cities are those that see their entire parking supply as a community resource. And so that's something we would want to strive towards. Something you already have. Most cities have uniform time stays. 
you go back to Everett, one block face in Everett before we went to 90 minute parking, they went to 90 minute. One block face had six different time stays. Or they would have two hours on this side of the street and 30 minutes, an entire block face on the other side of the street. It was very confusing. So successful cities simplify their parking systems. I think that's the message. Common branding and marketing, shared use agreements, and generally employees off street. Unless it's just really, really, I'll give you the one example again about Springfield, Oregon. They, their occupancies are so low on street that they have a zone A, which is the core, two hours only. Zone B, which was empty during the day, is three hours or by permit, kind of like your garage. But they thought, let's put some employees on the street in the interim to make it look like it's being used. Because they, again, at 45%, not having parking uh, looked really bad. It was hurting businesses, and it wasn't attracting businesses. So the two things that businesses look at when they come to locate in your downtown, is the system robust, and is there absorption capacity? So what scares businesses coming into downtowns is it's too full. Why would I want to be here? And boy, nobody's here. I can't, you know, I won't be able to afford to be here. So, in, in, so this, the example of Springfield was they actually made their system look better, but they preserved the core. So employees is a big issue. And finally, the wave in transportation right now, believe it or not, the big wave across the country in parking is alternative modes. Making alternative modes cool. The owner of the business rides to work. The CEO takes the bus. Uh, they have employee programs that incent people to walk once a month to work. It's amazing what's happening. Uh, I'm working right now in downtown Ashland, Oregon. Guess who put a bike corral in front of the Oregon Shakespearean Festival? The Oregon Shakespearean Festival. They took two parking stalls away from themselves and put 16 bike racks that are full all the time. Someone told the Oregon Shakespearean Festival, no one will ride to a play. It's 106 degrees there in, in July. There's snow on the ground um, in um, December. And the Oregon Shakespearean Festival said, we want to make that cool. And they have. And so those two parking stalls, they get 16 trips a day out of two parking stalls. In the past, they were getting about you know four or five cars up max in those stalls. So it, it, it's interesting because it's not parking, but that's, the, that's what successful cities are doing, is, is integrating with the alternative modes. So what is parking? Parking is not your product. Parking supports your product. The product is your business's downtown. Um, and that's a really important, that's the role of parking. It's also is and has to be a shared asset. It's a community responsibility. It's not just the city's responsibility to uh, provide parking to every user. It's only one tool in your toolbox, and it requires active management. One of the things I said before is, uh, or what I will say is, a lot of cities get parking plans. That is a verb, that, that is a noun, parking plan. We're going to give you a parking management program. Management is a verb. Too many cities have plans. Not enough cities have active strategic management. You do it every day, 365 days a year. That's the difference between a parking plan and a parking management program. What parking is not. When's the last time someone said to you, hey, it's Friday night, let's go downtown and park. Parking is not the reason people come here. Your product is the reason that people come here. It's not a generator of trips, and it's not a silver bullet. Every successful city that we work with is managing their parking, but they haven't fixed it. They've just made it better. <clears throat> successful cities are messy. I worked with an economic development director who once told me our goal is to have messy vitality in the downtown. We need people on the street. We need a certain level of congestion. Go back to the sweet spot of the 70 to 85 percent. You'll never fix the problem. The key is to continually manage it. And I think that's, that's something that we have to learn and make the commitment to manage it. 